So this is the last session for today. It's uh, last in terms of chrono no, chronological order, but it's not uh, uh, the last in terms of meaning. And so it's going uh, to be about planned and lived reality, appropriation and conversion of public and private space. This contradiction between public and private space is one of the uh, main um, themes of this time period because we can see a uh, different interpretation of public space after avant-garde and this can be seen in um, Soviet research uh, institutes when there were uh, tiny um, rooms uh, for uh, staff members but very big uh, assembly halls uh, uh, so that um, uh, all the engineers and uh, uh, scholars could discuss their issues easily so that they felt comfortable. Many Many Soviet people moved to uh, private apartments, so they had their own bathtub, so they could use them um, as much as they wanted. They didn't have to follow a time schedule that was typical when people lived in communal apartments. So we hope to have a very productive session. We are going to have three speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Mart Kalm. He's going to tell us about farmers. Uh, uh, and uh, um, the um, uh, and um, uh, the way they practiced an urban lifestyle. Um, he is the rector of um, uh, the Academy of Fine Arts in Estonia. He is also going to talk about the architecture of Estonian collective farms during the late Soviet period. The second speaker will be Alexander uh, Bigbov. Uh, he uh, is uh, a well-known sociologist and uh, he published a book that became very popular. And so um, we are going to have him coming second. And then uh, we are going to have Stephen Harris is our third speaker. He um, uh, wrote a fantastic book about uh, Soviet architecture, Soviet housing uh, during Khrushchev period and now he is studying airports and this is one of the um, most important spaces uh, for the period of late modernism. And um, um, I would like to thank all the speakers and I just uh, want to ask you to stick to the time limit. Thank you. Добрый вечер. Я очень рад снова быть здесь в Москве. Но, пожалуйста, извините, что мой русский язык не на достаточном уровне, и я должен продолжать по-английски. So, uh, thank you for this generous invitation to this inspiring event. For me, it's very interesting to be again here in Moscow. But my talk today is about the architecture of collective farms in Estonia, in Soviet Estonia. In the in the second half of the of the 20th century, there was no significant construction in rural Europe. Instead, it was a period when villages began to decline. Industrialization, which caused urbanization and also a surplus of agricultural workers because of the industrialization in agriculture meant villages began to empty. Nearly everywhere, infrastructure built in the first half of the 20th century in, in the form of farms, schools, community halls, shops, uh, and so forth, was now in surplus. But Soviet Estonia surprisingly provides an ex exception to this trend with fervent construction in rural areas, and despite of the aggressiveness of forced collectivization, Estonia became a special case in the modernization of agriculture. Within a new economic conditions, collective enterprises fairly blossomed in the 1960s to 1980s in Estonia and also in Latvia and Lithuania. The higher living standards provided by the collective farms even managed to slow down urbanization, and the new settlement patterns established by the collective farms, along with the infrastructure they developed, helped establish the right conditions for the growth of ambitious architecture. How did this happen? 
for Estonia, the loss of independence and the Soviet occupation that resulted from the World War II was not the full extent of the tragedy. The collectivization of agriculture that took place after the mass deportation of farming families to Siberia in 1949 was one of the greatest traumas caused by the Soviet occupation. These Stalinist changes destroyed rural life and in the 1950s agricultural production decreased significantly. When the terror abated in the Khrushchev uh, period and at the end of the 1950s liberal reforms gave, gave the collective farms more room to move, Estonian farmers slowly began to adjust and started seeking new ways to manage within these unavoidable conditions. On the whole, farmers who had uh, been forced to give their farms to the collectives were bitter. And so it was the next generation of agronomists, veterinarians, and so on, educated in the post-war Soviet universities and colleges, uh, who built up the collective farms and who naturally brought their expertise to the modernization process. Collective farms, col horses in the Soviet Union, were cooperative and not uh, state-owned, and therefore were slightly less regulated and even had elements of free market economics. In the 1960s, collective farms in the Estonian SSSR established agricultural ma mass production, mostly in the dairy farming, uh, but also pig and poultry farming. Even though general production levels remained low, mass production meant extensive land improvement along with creation of large tractor-sized fields, the continuation of breeding, mechanization, building large farms with over 1,000 dairy cows, and so on. In 1971, an Estonian cow produced 3,200 kilograms of milk per year while the average Soviet cow produced 2,100, and the average Danish cow produced almost 4,000. It is interesting to note that during the prisoner period of the 1970s, the economy in the Soviet Union as a whole deteriorated, but mass production in collective farms in Estonia continued to grow rapidly. In the distribution of roles across the entire Soviet Union, the role of agriculture in the Estonia was to supply meat and dairy products uh, for Estonia with its population of one and a half million and the Leningrad Oblast, uh, which was much, many times larger, almost four million. Production levels were not high enough to be able to abundantly supply shops either in Estonia or beyond the Nalva River. Nevertheless, Estonia was rewarded generously for exceeding sales quotas. The Russian market in particular swallowed up the entire productive output and collective farms in Estonia were able to enjoy a, a uniquely stable market. Estonian collective farms used the profit to build production facilities and over the years also new collective farm centers, usually based in existing villages and these for an average of 400 to 800 inhabitants. They included residential housing, administrative building, a community hall or clubhouse, shops, canteen, kindergarten, school, sports hall, sauna, uh, etc. And here you can see one of the propaganda pictures from 70s when, uh, where one of those kolhoz uh, centers is uh, shown. In the foreground, you see uh, the shop and canteen. Uh, on the right, the big building is the administrative center together with a clubhouse. But it's interesting that uh, in early uh, 60s, uh, in the Khrushchev time, the uh, standard designs, the type design the buildings were very important and there was quite a lively exchange between the Baltic countries and that's why uh, this uh, administrative center uh, come clubhouse is a Lithuanian standard design. 
And at the edges of the uh, village, you see the, the, the standard uh, apartment blocks. And uh, in a far background, there are the pre-war uh, small farms, which has just preserved. Uh, it's interesting that, in, that it's, it's different in Estonia, uh, in the Baltic countries, in the Baltic republics, and the rest of the USSR, that um, most of the collective farms built uh, the same level building, uh, similar buildings. It wasn't not the typical Soviet model, when in each oblast you have one or two model farms which are well equipped and uh, the rest of the uh, villages are quite poor, that uh, here as a country with quite a Lutheran background in their general attitudes, uh, the, 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 the centers were quite similar. And just a couple of uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, uniquely designed shops and uh, canteens. But, sorry, no. But the, mm, from the architectural point of view, the most important building was usually the administrative center. And if the first administrative centers in early 60s were mainly standard designed, uh, typical buildings, then this Kultna by architect Valve, a female architect, Valve Pormes, there was a uh, kind of uh, breaking point. Uh, one thing that the, this building also was awarded to the national prize, uh, not national nowadays, you can say, uh, the Soviet Estonian state prize for this architecture, but, but also uh, this uh, quite uh, Scandinavian look, what the building has, uh, was kind of uh, created an uh, alien uh, slice of space there. Uh, it was, you'd, the people who visited this had a feeling that the Soviet Estonians who visited the place had a feeling that now I am outside of uh, Soviet Union. If I am around this building or inside this building, I am li now like in abroad. Uh, of course, also the interiors of the buildings uh, strengthen this feeling of uh, being abroad. Uh, how could you imagine these uh, normal Soviet rituals, uh, like uh, Octus to celebrate the 1st of May or the 9th of October, in the 9th of November? Uh, in these surroundings, which, which more reminds you the Scandinavian churches of early 50s, and as it was an experimental poultry farm, this almost abstract bronze uh, sculpture is actually named a bird. So uh, there is a certain hint to the poultry farming. Uh, it's interesting that uh, in the special issue of uh, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui in 1970, the special Soviet issue, also this uh, Kurtna administrative building was published. And uh, I have always thought that how uh, this uh, numero was composed, because it uh, present, represents, it represents uh, uh, disproportionately a lot of architecture from Estonia. And uh, today um, I was happy to get to know from uh, Jean-Louis Cohen that uh, it was Anatol Kopp who uh, composed it and whose choices they were there because it can't be, uh, it was too uh, unorthodox composition. It couldn't be initiated from uh, Moscow. Uh, it's interesting that uh, really, uh, in this case, uh, where the Thomas Rain is the author and probably one of the most well-known Estonian Soviet architects from the 1970s, uh, about whom you can find in Architektur SSSR several essays, 
uh, of course, because, uh, partly because Andrei Gozak was his uh, very good friend. But, uh, but also, Andrei Gozak liked uh, Thomas Rain because Thomas Rain for, was, for him, uh, the Soviet uh, version of his admired Finnish architecture. Uh, and this is interesting that uh, this uh, Sverdlov collective farm, which is in a far, mm, it's a really in a remote place close to the Latvian border, and it was quite poor Kolhos, but uh, uh, the collective Kolhos uh, chairman went to Tallinn usually and just uh, and, and visited uh, the architectural office there. And it was uh, absolutely um, randomly uh, the tasks were given to architect, and that's why it could ha easily happen that uh, one of the best architect designed to a quite poor and uh, underdeveloped collective farm its uh, its um, big oeuvre. Uh, and by the way, uh, because it's so in a so remote place, that's why the building doesn't ex almost exist anymore, and it's in ruins. Uh, the nearby is uh, another uh, collective farm center by Thomas Rain. If you look at these uh, Japanese uh, roofs, you can see that uh, the tabi or lava was just mentioned uh, in Olga's paper uh, was served also as an attractive example for Estonian architects, a tabi swimming pool with a similar type of roof. And here, uh, which by, uh, by its architecture is not so outstanding uh, piece, uh, but uh, it's, uh, in my mind, fantastic how these scraffitos were made just for the, which is quite expensive form of art, and these were made to decorate the ordinary hall of this the club of the collective farm hall. And it's also in ruins. Uh, this uh, example I choose because uh, of the funny story behind it. Um, it was not easy to start buildings because of the quotas and the limits, uh, because of the shortage of building materials in Soviet Union. And the, this collective farm got a um, permission to build the fire water tank. But uh, they developed the fire, fire water tank to the sauna, swimming pool, medical center, laundry, hairdressers, or uh, really a multitude of functions in one uh, building. The architect is an unimportant uh, local guy. Now, um, the Soviet uh, Communist Party program of 1961 for the building up communism repeated Marx and Engels' idea of eliminating the differences between the country and the city. But uh, what was actually meant was that an urban lifestyle should be established in the country so that everyone could have electricity, running water, and other modern conveniences. There was no talk of bringing the advantages of country life uh, <clears throat> to the city, such as the fresh air or beautiful surroundings. And therefore, this reduction of differences was imbalanced. To achieve uh, the desired conveniences, building uh, homes in the country meant building apartment blocks. And these are the, mm, the first one, the countryside uh, mm, partners to the Fushovkas in the cities. Uh, the, the Latvian red brick was, the yellow brick was one of the very few possibilities to enliven the architecture. Uh, starting from 1964, uh, uh, the Kostroy of Estonia pursued that you must build uh, free floor uh, apartment blocks because then it was compulsory to make a sewage and central heating. And that was actually the real modernization of uh, buildings because the previous version was just a modernist shell, but the uh, toilets outside and uh, the water from the well. And by 80s, this was the most typical way of the, how the collective farm people lived. 
and they had a right to have their garden plots also. And here you see, it, in my mind, these garden plots and also the cow sheds for animals, they make, in my mind, uh, this urban lifestyle in countryside most ridiculous. And here I have, I don't have a so good example from Estonia, but this is from, La from Lithuania, uh, the places where they had a prefabricated uh, city-like settlement. And behind these uh, apartment blocks, they have gardening plots. And in the background, you see their uh, cow houses. And in the other side of the village, the cow houses are even uh, so uh, uniformly designed. But uh, after a while, groups of single family homes started to be built on the edge of the town like settlements, usually in attractive surroundings. Of course, it was the leaders of the collective farms who moved in, but also because official propaganda disapproved of segregation, then usually, then usually the best tractor drivers and milkers did too. The, these who uh, did uh, drink and steal less. But most single family homes were part of the motivation package offered to the technocratic elite, to the specialists with tertiary qualifications on whom the success of the collecting farm depended. Uh, in some cases, they uh, pursued some industrialization of uh, uh, one of single family dwellings, but they were not very big factories. The production was quite limited. And here you see the most uh, popular standard design for uh, these one family dwellings. It was called the uh, Kulli Pesa, which is translated as Hawk's Nest because the name of the architect was Kull, Hawk. And this was quite a nice combination between the, uh, the dreams of the modernist architects who wanted to have a flat roof and to the uh, inhabitants who were interested to have slanted roof. And uh, probably these uh, Kulipesa uh, dwellings have been one of the most successful and the best survived part of the collective farms because you can hardly find any of them in a ruined form. The Kolhos and Sorhos centers combined elements of urban and rural life. The happiest people were the privileged few who belonged to the technocratic elite and could live, live in a private house. In this way, the noble image of promised happiness in the communist in the communist ideology took on a relatively petit bourgeois form. If the title of our conference, A Long Happy Life of Soviet Cities After 1956, sounds ironically in the context of, uh, Soviet, of the Soviet Estonia, then the life in, Soviet, uh, in Estonian kolhoses was probably slightly happier than in the cities. Thank you. Um, I have one question which might be almost a bit, a bit too obvious. Why was it successful? Like, you know, the, 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 uh, although uh, industrially in certain respects the Soviet Union was a success, in its agricultural policy it was a disaster, like a complete disaster from start to finish. So how is it that the Estonian Kolkhozes were successful when they were so unsuccessful everywhere else? And is there any way that, that uh, is there any sort of similarity between that and, say, other successes in collective agriculture like kibbutzes in Israel, for instance? Because it just does, it can't just be because they're Protestants. There must be another reason. Sorry, what can be? Um, I, I, I just wonder what the explanation is for how Estonian collective farms managed to work so well and everywhere else they worked so badly and what, what that reason was. And, I, I, and I'm wondering if it's something other than the fact that they were Protestants. Were well, Lutherans? They were Lutherans. I'm being sarcastic with the last yeah. point, but uh, I just wondering. One of the explanations I, I mentioned was uh, that the, the Russian market was bottomless. It's a uniquely stable market uh, situation. Mm. Uh, once I have used uh, in a title of about Kolkhoz architecture uh, uh, the metaphor of oases. 
that it has been partly an oasis. Never ever uh, later we haven't found such good a market situation. Whatever you produce, they swallow up everything. But wouldn't that be true of everywhere in the Soviet Union, that they had this huge bottomless market? Like, how is it that Estonians specifically managed to make it work and no one else did? Like, surely that market existed anyway. Uh, you know, like, like someone at a collective farm in Ukraine could s also have that gigantic Russian market, but they didn't have, make it successful in the same way. I understood that, um, of course, the, the s to say about this Lutheranism, the Lutheran background, is politically very incorrect. But uh, I would say that the certain traditions just uh, uh, prolonged, and uh, uh, Estonian um, culture, in a, in a wide meaning, has mainly been a peasant culture. And uh, um, in Estonia, uh, to be a peasant has never been uh, humiliating, uh, to say so. Uh, they have always been that to be a peasant has always been meant. A respect, a respectful people, and that's why the farming uh, people were has always been a normal, important, uh, sometimes even a leading part of the society, and just this tradition uh, continued. Um, I was just wondering, how does Estonia now um, care for this architectural heritage? Um, I assume there are no collective farms anymore. So, what are these buildings used? Uh, are they kept? Um, what is happening to them these days? Uh, most of them are ruined, as I mentioned, but they didn't want to make my presentation too depressive, so I, I left outside the pictures of all the buildings in ruins. But this Kutna uh, building, this is listed as a mo monument, and it's uh, reconstructed as a hotel. It doesn't function very well as a hotel, but it's mainly used for parties, so that you can have wedding or jubilee and uh, party in this uh, fan-shaped uh, hall, and then the former rooms for the portrait researchers are now uh, installed as uh, hotel rooms. But uh, the housing, these apartment blocks, uh, they are mainly in ruins, and there are thousands of ruins, and there are big uh, discussions that um, the uh, right-wing politicians say that we must uh, clean up the country of this Kolhosi's uh, uh, remnants that they are eyesore. And at the same time, the young people who have a lot of interest towards the Soviet heritage, and of course there is a uh, uh, nostalgic discourse of former Kolhos uh, people who are proud uh, of it and they, they want to preserve it. But the fact is that uh, if the successful Kolhos is slowed down the urbanization process, but in early 90s when the Kolhos is all collapsed because uh, Russia closed down their borders and we were unable to export our agricultural like, produce to Russia anymore and uh, they were not enough good to be exported to the Western Europe. The whole agriculture collapsed and the people uh, left to the cities. Um, you mentioned that there was this practice of uh, maintaining gardening plots in the proximity of these uh, apartment blocks. And you said that was a ridiculous practice. I wonder, is it just because it's uh, kind of unconventional or there were some practical disadvantages uh, from your point of view in this practice? Uh, because, uh, thank you for this very interesting question, but uh, uh, in, my, in my understanding, it's really strange uh, to work, for example, in the farm the whole day, then come home, uh, take your own uh, feed for your anim for your own car, and to take a next uh, 200 meter journey to go to feed your car. Uh, of course, it caused a lot of confusion. Quite often, just the kolhos feed uh, was forgotten in your hand while you left your workplace and approached to your own animal. So it was it's, uh, it's favored uh, stealing in collective farms also. And it would be, in my mind, it would be normal. Uh, it's good if you have your own animals, but it's nice to have them if you live with them together, so that you sense them, they make noise if they have a problem. You, 
it's in the old farms you live together with your animals, but now you are alienated from your animals. You have you have your conveniences in your apartment, and some half a kilometer away is are your animals and your. My question was about garden, not not animal breeding, garden, growing plants. Sorry. I don't hear. Uh, I'm sorry, but my, my question was about gardening, about uh, plants growing, not about animal breeding. Would you prefer to cut uh, basilic for your uh, soup uh, from just behind the door and not to, not to go for the green for the soup a half kilometer journey to your plot and then return? Just I would prefer it to be next to me, uh, this garden plant. Марта, я должна попросить прощения, но мы не успеваем к сожалению, дать ему время. Спасибо вам огромное. Вопросы можно будет потом задать кулуарно.